Now, I'm honored to be here and be presenting this information, and I feel like uh, I have a great responsibility uh, to lead people into the light and out of the darkness. And half the time at the Portland Preparedness Center, uh, I feel more like a counselor than someone helping people get prepared. Uh, people come in panicked, um, asking me when the time, when will the time arrive when we have to head to the hills as if it's assumed that we're automatically going to have to head to the hills. And I know that I remember in 2008, before Obama became the president, while Bush was still the president, there was a lot of talk of running to the hills. And there was a lot of talk of, of oh, maybe Bush is going to uh, implement some sort of a false flag so he can stay in power. Uh, based on some sort of a wacky perception that this was all about George W. Bush and his presidency. And for some, uh, you know, uh, reason, they would need to keep him in the White House to continue this agenda. And now it's obvious to everybody that is aware and open-minded and looking at the facts that nothing's changed, it's only gotten worse. The zombie apocalypse is already here. But not everybody's a zombie in this zombie apocalypse. You see, with the Portland Mercury and you know, some of the editorials, little, little stories that have come out in the last year or so, and I don't dislike everything that's in the Mercury, um, and I'm honored that the Mercury interviewed me last week, and uh, I believe it's going to be in the uh, paper next week. Sarah Merck is a very nice lady that did come down to the PPC and talk to me about the store and what motivated me to open the store. Um, but the Mercury is always kind of tongue-in-cheek, ha-ha, he-he, joking about the zombie apocalypse, which is primarily motivated from what? Pop culture, Shaun of the Dead, all these zombie films. But why is the image of the zombie so prevalent uh, in our culture, in Hollywood? It's because the zombie apocalypse is already arrived. We are surrounded here in Portland with humans that have lost the ability to smile at an oncoming stranger, on Hawthorne Street, on Burnside, in the hipster neighborhood, in the Pearl District, in Knob Hill, on the east side, in Felony Flats, the list goes on. In Gresham, you feel that tension. Back to, instead of people being upset at the government or that which is controlling the government, in reality, we're supposed to be the government, but a lot of people, uh, they're out to launch in terms of that reality. All of this is important to understand. Um, that to be revolutionary in Portland, to be truly different is to be someone that smiles, that's warm, that's pleasant, that truly does see the bright side of life, but also is emotionally mature enough to take a look at all this dirty nastiness that's being done in our name. Now, in terms of what's gonna be happening to the United States in the next couple of years, we do have to keep this in perspective. Things traditionally have to get worse before they get better. After all, who the hell goes to the dentist and asks for a root canal if they don't need a root canal? Only an insane person would do that. Yet as a society, we seem to be waiting collectively, especially people in our own city, for a major crisis to motivate them to build the community that they really need, to make their connection with their fellow brother and sister. So those of us that are aware understand that traditionally, things have to shift, people's comfort zone has to be removed in order for the motivation to step into their consciousness that says, hey, you know what? We need to make a difference. There needs to be some change, not only in the world, but in my life. Now, Alcoholics Anonymous, it's a popular organization worldwide. They deal with alcoholics. You see, um, there's always a real root cause of a problem. But not all humans are emotionally mature enough to look at the root cause of the problem or aware enough to truly look at what's really going on, what other external factors may be contributing to a self-destructive lifestyle, you see. AA is based on the principle that you genetically have a disease. There's something wrong with you and you have to admit that you're powerless over your addiction in order to get out of the hell that you're in. There's something that I've found over the years. As someone that has experienced a feeling of great pain and sorrow uh, when I was in my early 20s and struggling with certain things in this town, 
I later understood when I became an activist and started this show that by helping others, you help yourself. By speaking up against corruption, it builds a certain courage in you, a certain fire, a certain spark that I feel is lacking a lot of people. And instead of going into AA and things like that to deal with whatever was bothering me, I was chasing this root cause of the problem and realizing, wait a minute, I'm not currently living the life I've meant to, I'm meant to live and I'm in pain because there's something going on in the world that's bothering me, a certain darkness that's creeping closer and closer towards our villages, towards our city, feeling that parasitic energy feeding on society and it creates a sad feeling for some people so they medicate. Once that awakening, that door was opened, I kicked it straight open and kept going forward and I realized that I am actually helping myself by helping others. This is why I do what I do with a birth name, uh, my own birth name, instead of changing it or creating a stage name. This is why I'm easily accessible in Portland. People can find me and talk to me. And I'm not afraid of an assassination attempt because I'm living my life without regrets and that feels good. That makes me feel good. That makes me every day want to get out of bed and do something great, make someone smile. And that feels revolutionary. Again, when I'm in Portland, and I, I remember doing it last night, someone's walking by, you feel some sort of an anxious energy and you force yourself, but last night it really wasn't a force. It came natural, a smile, and instantly a smile comes back. We can change a lot of the dirty energy that's out there in Portland if we apply ourselves to the task. If we view reality like some random circumstance, random collection of events, that we have no power, that it's always been this way, well, then there should be no surprise why we're feeling, well, frankly, stuck. So being prepared, developing community, finding out who you are in this is all very critical to healing ourselves from whatever is bothering us, but of course, making the transition to a freer world, independent from dependence, not dependent on food stamps, not dependent on the system, not dependent on the Federal Reserve notes uh, coming into our pocket, uh, unemployment benefits, zeros and ones, instantaneous deposits, direct deposits into our bank accounts. Banks that, of course, that are run by the global elite. How is that independent? But once someone, because this economic meltdown is building warriors out of some people, whether the government or not expected that to happen, who knows, but it's happening. Once someone lives with less and they're removed from their comfort zone and they have to survive and apply themselves and perhaps in a survival situation, activate a larger portion of our brains. It changes us forever when we accomplish that task. Now, yeah, we're only in this body one time, that I'm aware of at least. We only live once in these fleshly bodies. Do we live on? Have we lived before? Are we part of a collective consciousness? I feel in my body that we do and that I have lived before and will live again. So there's no need for me to be attached to this body. This is a temporary existence on earth that we're all sharing. And if we sit here in our own fecal matter, waiting for someone else to clean it up, to take care of ourselves, to help us survive, we're not going to evolve to what we're meant to evolve to. We're here for a reason. And some say, this is the real hell not the utopia, not the heaven. We don't need to be concerned about a fiery Christian. Not all people view hell the same way, so let me not label this Christian. But the mainstream view of hell, I believe, is a lot further from the truth than one might believe that's going to a mainstream church. They ought to look around at the world around them when they speak of Satan in the church. They ought to look at the government and how the church how the Bible is used to kill millions and millions, perhaps billions over time, on this earth. Now, is that what Jesus would do, seriously? What would Jesus do if he was alive today? It's always a great question to come back to. But for those of you that have a negative connotation of anything dealing with Jesus or Christianity, for those that are spiritual, here's another question to pose oneself. What would a ascended master do in this situation as all this melts down? So I feel, and we'll talk about some of these toys I brought today, show and tell, things you might want to add to your grab and go pack or add to your house. Being prepared to me only has so much to do with what we're about to show you. 
It has more to do with spiritual preparedness. Being prepared to walk through not a literal fire, but whatever is coming to us in the not so distant future. Anyone that's strong enough to walk away from everything, to walk away from their job, and go out and be able to survive is an asset to anyone, is an asset to themselves. They don't need anything. And anyone that's able to be calm in a crisis, when people are getting shot in the head, when women are getting raped, anyone that's calm enough in a crisis is going to have a clear head. I want to be one of those people. I get very upset, I get very alarmed at some of these things taking place, but I understand the larger picture, that we're here on earth to learn. That whether or not we choose to activate our free will will determine where we go specifically from here on out when we leave these fleshly bodies. This is why it does matter. Despite the fact you may think that it's always been this way, that women have always been enslaved, that we've always been at war, that there's always been some sort of struggle of the races, is not an excuse to allow ourselves to look the other way or turn the other cheek when people are getting hurt around us. When someone has enough faith in a higher power, in their guardian angels, and they apply that faith to their life, to where if they see somebody getting harmed, they're going to help them because they believe that it's the right thing to do, that it's morally the correct thing to do, and they will have backing from the angelic forces, especially when it's done with that type of intent. And you summon those protective guardian spirits. And there's nothing that you have to lose from believing in such things. You have everything to lose from believing that death Darkness and destruction is the only thing that awaits you in the next couple years. You have everything to lose from believing that they've got you by the balls and they've got you by the breasts. You've got your whole life and your soul in jeopardy. I don't believe one can sell their soul. I believe one can lease out their soul. For a period of time, there's a whole lot of people out there in this world right now that got to break that deal with the devil. Having said that, I've got a lot more to talk about. We've got some news to cover, but I want to come over here and show you some of the products that I brought to the gun show today over at